patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 99 of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Tylosky. Thank you all so much for joining me for this week's Sacred Honor series episode featuring Matthew Thornton, a signer from the colony of New Hampshire. Before we get into our main core of the episode today, be sure to subscribe to Friends and Fellow Citizens if you haven't already. And I've also got one major announcement for the show. As you all know, we've had episodes every single week since episode one, which is crazy to even imagine. Uh, it's been a remarkable journey, and we're going to keep going. I mean, this is a w- amazing project that I really have so much faith in, and it's all because of all of our listeners, our Patreon supporters, our li- listeners, the family and friends who have supported me throughout this journey. Next month, I will be starting my studies in the political science department at the University of Alabama, and I will be starting my PhD program there. I'm super, super excited to be conducting new research and really focusing on how America has gotten to a point of political polarization. That's really kind of the general area that I'm interested in looking at perhaps more going on the legislative politics route or some other direction, but this is really one I want to know more about through my research and through my studies. Because of the new workload that will be upon me with my teaching assistantship, as well as my other duties with regards to studies, I will be modifying our podcast schedule to better reflect my new lifestyle, but also to keep the essential content and the great interviews and solo episodes that we do every single week. And so to modify the schedule to be able to accommodate my new busy schedule this coming August 2022, I will be having a new schedule where it will be two episodes every month and it will be the first two Mondays of each month. So the first week, the first Monday, will be an interview episode The second will be a solo episode. And just like the format which we use for the solo episodes, it will alternate between a standard solo episode and a Sacred Honor Series episode. So in August, we will have our interview episode on the first Monday, and then the second Monday, we will have our Sacred Honor Series episode. And then in September, first week interview episode, second week will be a standard solo episode, and so on and so forth. I think this is a great opportunity to also not only cater to the, you know life's course and the events that it take that takes that take place in life with my new schedule, but I think it's also an opportunity to uh, let listeners be able to digest more of the episodes. You know, having two episodes every month and being able to maybe even create longer episodes, slightly longer episodes. And uh, this is a great way to obviously get more discussion, more ideas per episode. So I hope that this schedule will be really, really effective for the program. And it, it's not going to divert any any effort whatsoever from the amazing work that we've been able to do together. It was really since that day in August 2020, all the way till the end of July, that we've done an episode every single week. With this new schedule, I hope it'll reflect a, a better way to have friends and fellow citizens. And be sure to stay tuned and subscribe to our podcast and subscribe to our email list if you haven't already to see the latest updates. We'll probably be able to re- revamp the uh, email s- system so that you'll get a, an email every month to uh, really condense down the, the content and make it easier for our email subscribers. So be sure to stay tuned for more news that are that is coming up later this month as well. But this is the big one, the new schedule. I'll be sure to remind folks 
uh, as, as we start that new schedule in August, August 1st, 2022. Now, to our main content. So today I'm going to be speaking a little bit about Matthew Thornton, the signer uh, from New Hampshire, and I'm going to be only focusing a little bit on him today. Uh, the rest is really going to be a reflection on, if you can believe it, it's already been about a year since we started the Sacred Honor Series episodes. And I didn't really know what to expect out of these other than really trying to hone in on the civic messages that were coming out from the signers of the Declaration of Independence in order in which they signed it to the best of my ability. There's really no formal record of you know, how the, the signatures were, uh, were signed, but the order, the roll call was in order from north to south. And it's likely that Matthew Thornton was more one of the last ones to sign, but I didn't really want to alienate him too much. And you know, he he wasn't even elected to the Continental Congress when the vote was taken. So you got to give Thornton some credit for showing up because that in itself was kind of a difficult thing for some other people who may have supported the independence cause, but didn't, didn't have a name or a signature on the record. While well, I focus on a little bit, and then I want to really reflect on one year of the Sacred Honors series and some some big takeaways that I've gotten, but maybe some things that uh, that you all are thinking about too. So let's get started. Matthew Thorne was born in Ireland on March the third, seventeen fourteen. So he was actually one of the older signers. By the time the Declaration of Independence was drafted and uh, ratified and signed in 1776, he his family immigrated to North America uh, in 1716. Uh, what's scary is that in 1722 his home was actually burned uh, with the conflict with the Native Americans, and uh, you know that that had to be. And I, I haven't really haven't found a lot of documents relating to you know his view on that experience, but I imagine that it really shaped the way he was able to learn from university, from learning, losing a home, especially when you've just moved to a new part of the world for only six years. He eventually became uh, involved in medicine. He did his studies in medicine. He became a physician, established his practice in Londonderry, New Hampshire. Uh, he was obviously someone who had political ambitions. And so later on, uh, he was uh, serving in the Provincial Assembly in New Hampshire, he served there for about four years. It's from 1758 to 1762. And he also served in the uh, Continental Militia as well. He served for a few years there. Thornton is someone who is relatively obscure in terms of the ability for him to have a have a extensive record one that I can certainly put out to the audience today however what I can say is is really the significance of him signing the declaration of independence even months after the the uh, most of the other signers had signed the document already the reason why I say that is because as you recall in our discussion about the other signers Signing the Declaration of Independence was was like signing your death warrant, or at least that was the perception that people had at the time. The signers knew that. Anyone who supported independence knew that. I find it very significant that Dr. Thornton, who became the 14th signer of the Declaration of Independence, was brave enough to be able to sign that historic document months after when there was still so much doubt about what was going to happen to the signers and the fact that he was also elected and not only elected, but also helped draft the New Hampshire state constitution, the first draft, after the royal governor had basically left and just, just never showed up again. Uh, the fact that he set that first step, especially for a new uh, small colony like New Hampshire, for a small place like New Hampshire, this was an incredibly big deal, I think, for the times. I will read one quote from Dr. Thornton, and it reads, quote, Friends and brethren, you must all be sensible that the affairs of America have, at length, come to a very effective and alarming crisis. 
the horrors and distresses of a civil war, which, till of late, we only had in contemplation, we now find ourselves obliged to realize. Painful beyond expression have been those scenes of blood and devastation, which the barbarous cruelty of British troops have placed before our eyes. Duty to God, to ourselves, to posterity, ends forced by the cries of slaughtered innocents, have urged us to take up arms in our own defense. We seriously and earnestly recommend the practice of that pure and undefiled religion, which embalmed the memory of our pious ancestors as that alone upon which we can build a solid hope and confidence in the divine protection and favor, without whose blessing all the measures of safety we have or can propose will end in our shame and disappointment, unquote. And this is a statement that he released to the people of New Hampshire when he took office as the chairman of the Provincial Committee of Safety, which was in charge of helping with troops and weapons and so on and so forth. Dr. Thorne was, again, a very prominent person in drafting that first state constitution, which was adopted months before the actual Declaration of Independence was adopted in January of 1776. He was also elected to that new legislature, elected speaker of that assembly. He really got himself immersed. And again, this is a very common theme among signers, but it's really about getting involved, even in those smaller local level elections. That's how one climbs up that ladder, ladder and develop that experience and credibility when it comes to running for office later in the future. Uh, Dr. Thornton is also known to represent uh, small small towns. He was he was always known as a very personable uh, physician, uh, someone who not only served in the American Revolution War, uh, but also was one to be able to get to have a good sense of humor, a great character. He just was really able to get along with some other people. He had all apparently had a very great lifestyle. I guess. I guess when you're a physician, you kind of understand one, a thing or two about vitality, but he was one of, I think, the more longer longer living signers of the Declaration of Independence. He, he passed away on June 4th, 1803 in Newburyport, Massachusetts at the age of 89. So Dr. Thorne, I think the big takeaway I would say for the signer is that even though he was largely absent for most of the months after that official ratification of the Declaration of Independence. He didn't sign until later, around October, November-ish, somewhere around that timeline of 1776. The fact that he was still willing to travel in and down from New Hampshire to Philadelphia to be able to put his name on the record, what that means to me, at least as someone who's interested in you know, civics and history is it, show is a show of dedication. And it's a show that it's there's it's one thing to support a cause, but it's another to be able to put one's name on the record. And I don't mean that for you know for fame or for popularity, but the the whole idea of putting that name, of putting oneself out there and saying, you know what, I'm supporting this cause, this cause for independence, even though I could lose my house again. I mean he already lost one house he probably could have lost another one. And so by having that courage, by being persistent, and I guess for other people to be impatient enough, you know, if someone were to not have a good character, I don't think a lot of people would be waiting for someone to uh, to come all the way down to, to sign the Declaration of Independence. It really takes a kind of character, it takes persistence, and that's something that I really can take away from Dr. Matthew Thornton. Now, I like to finish up our episode with some reflection. And these are some big takeaways, three main takeaways that um, I either realized before, uh, but maybe confirmed to to some degree with the production of the Sacred Honor Series episodes after 14 episodes to this day. But also there are a couple things in here that I didn't know about. And this is part of the learning process. I always say that with these podcast episodes, it's all about, it's a learning process for everyone, including the creator. The first one is that the vast majority of the signers 
we're not Boston Tea Party like figures. And and what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, generally, I think we have a perception that many of the signers or the people who are associated with the signers were the ones who were dressed like you know Mohawks or dressed like uh, Native Americans. You know, storming onto the the ships of Boston, the Boston uh, Harbor, and throwing tea out, and you know, and shouting all kinds of things. You know, just you know, just those kinds of people. We all like to imagine that that's kind of the the idea, or the tar and feathering, or the uh, assaults on the, on the tax collectors, or the bo- the boycotts, which you know a lot number of signers did call for and were part of. But you know, I'm speaking more about the people who were a bit crazier, a bit frenzier in the American Revolution. What I found is that a lot, many of these signers, if not all of them, played some kind of role in actually becoming, uh, in actually promoting some sort of civility in the midst of these tensions. One example, I think, is John Hancock. I didn't know much about John Hancock. I knew about the signature. I knew that he was, uh, he had the, obviously, the biggest signature there, but he was also the uh, president of the Continental Congress. And you would think that with his ship involved in some of the, the crazier riots that were happening, you would think that he would be one of those kinds of people helping with the uh, the arrangement of the Boston Tea Party. It turns out that he was actually a bit more moderate, and he was someone who really tried to maintain connections and speak with his counterparts, with British officials and merchants and and others who were involved in those tensions. He was not one to say, "Okay, I'm John Hancock. I don't like I don't like you guys, and so I'm just going to go and burn down your home." He was not like that, and 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 this is one of the goals of the Sacred Honor series, which is to really break down some of those previous perceptions of the signers. The signers really had to do so much work to in the behind the scenes, regardless of their flaws, they really had to maintain those connections. But, you know, Roger Sherman maintained connections with uh, with the uh, the governor, Governor Trumbull, or uh, with, uh, with uh, other signers, you know, still having relations with Governor Thomas Hutchinson of the Massachusetts colony. You know, the, and it's not that the independence movement or the cause was somehow diminished. It's rather that the signers, in many, in many ways, were the big difference between things going completely out of hand, perhaps to defeat, and uh, and the comparison, which was something that was more coordinated. Not that everything went well, you know, with regards to the battles and the, <laughs> the different disputes, but rather, and you think it really projects an, an idea of civility that out of this mess, out of this tension, there can be a new civilization. There can be a new country, a new way of governance. That, I think, is what makes this so significant. And so the fact that the vast majority of the signers, from what we've seen so far, are not you know, the frenzy rioters and protesters, it certainly is an optics thing too, uh, but I also believe that this is very much setting that precedent, going back to those fundamental principles of creating what would be the United States of America. The second takeaway, I'd say, is that each signer had his own views on everything from slavery to uh, voting to taxation to uh, the the war itself, maybe the logistics element, and largely respect, and these people largely respected each other's views, no matter how much these beliefs differed. And I say that because there were certain signers uh, who were very, very different on certain hot topics like slavery. For example, we saw with Stephen Hopkins how he was a slave owner from Rhode Island. From the same colony, though, the other signer, William Ellery, turned out to be one of the more forefronters of abolitionism. And not only was he a forefront, a forerunner of abolitionism or of, of civil rights, um, his son is fa- his family down the road also became involved in the abolitionist movement i've found that when americans can't see themselves in the signers regardless of what people's beliefs are then i think we have a real trouble with that disconnect between the signers and the people today i've learned so much more about what each signer believed and how while there are a lot of commonalities and a lot of political skill involved, uh, they were also very different. And some of them were well ahead of their times, some were well behind of their times. 
but each of them added a different strength to the ratification process of the Declaration of Independence. They each had their own story, their own way of dealing with their own constituents and their own people within their respective colonies. I think this is a really a hallmark of American politics and something that maybe we have lost a little bit today. Maybe today we need to learn from the signers and know that, sure, some people might be well ahead of the times, and a lot of times that, that might not work out for that person. But that doesn't mean that we can, we lose the element of civility. We need to bring back this element of how we might we come from the same country, but we also represent different constituencies. We need to also we need to know that sometimes if someone chooses to believe in or in something or create new legislation that we don't agree with, that's not necessarily a bad thing to us. It might just be that it's their prerogative. I use that classic example with. Um, in California, Nevada. I was born and raised in California. I recently moved to the Nevada, which has been a phenomenal journey. It's been a months long process, and I, I'm currently obviously broadcasting from uh, northern Nevada. This is our new home, and I, I'm now what when I used to be more vocal and used to be more upset, frustrated. Uh, the policies in California, I, I just personally, I personally have differences on on so many things over there. Well, I, mean, I used to be vocal. Nowadays, I'm a bit more calmer because I realize that as much as I can be opposed to views, it's ultimately down to the democratic process. If the people of a particular part of the country want to vote in a certain way, there is an element of having to respect their their views. Uh, unless that, and there, if there are you know, implications of beyond borders, that's a whole other conversation. But I, I've really learned a lot from how each signer, despite their different views, we're still able to get along with in each other. Generally speaking, fierce debates. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I, I'm sure that there was a lot of shouting at certain points during the Constitutional Convention. Not to mention that the heat in Philadelphia was probably not helping. But uh, this is, I think, a really big takeaway that I got from the Sacred Honor series so far. And number three, and this is something that I think really feeds in to the goal of Friends of Fellow Citizens, which is that there is so much gold, like valuable information and arguments and beliefs in these writings from the signers of the Declaration of Pence, from names we've, that we might have never heard of before. And I truly believe that there should be more efforts to highlight them. And I can tell you right now, this is what this podcast can help with. I've always told people, too, that it's not the end of you know Stephen Hopkins or of you know, of Elbridge Gary or of John Hancock after one episode. But this series is setting that foundation. I hope it sets that precedent of looking back at what these signers wrote and what they argued for, evaluate the merits of what they were saying, uh, but also to add more more language to and more understanding on the, the grounds of the American Revolution that we uh, honor so much. Just as this past week, as I'm recording, as the episode has been released as well, we celebrate the 4th of July. And to be able to reflect on these arguments, and knowing that every single one was able to say why they believed in some level of independence from Great Britain, but to say it in different ways, to have different arguments, using different experiences, that, I think, is what makes every signer unique. And so by highlighting the, some of these writings, some of these quotes, by broadcasting this to uh, to a, an audience out there, um, this is really, really a, a phenomenal learning lesson that I've received and something that I hope all of you out there have received as well. These are just some of the takeaways. I could go on and on, but I, I really want to condense this down to three for the sake of this episode. And I'm really, really excited to continue the Sacred Honor series, even with the new schedule, the, the the pace will be a little bit slower. However, I think it will give us ample time to be able to look more into some of these signers as we go down the list. We've got Matthew Thornton now as the 14th signer. Probably was not the 14th signer of the Declaration of Independence, but for the sake of the, the visuals on the Declaration of Independence, we'll put them down as the 14th signer. 
But uh, we've got so many more signers to cover, even with some of the ones of the some who became even presidents in the United States. This will be such a great experience for us to learn more about why they believed in what they believed in and how that maybe have carried on for all those years of service they eventually had. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. As you know, this is episode 99. So next week, we've got a milestone episode. This is quite quite an amazing feeling that uh, I'm having right now. And it's all thanks to all of you and to the friends and family that I have. Stay tuned for next week's episode 100. I cannot wait to make some more announcements there and to be able to bring out some more content for all of you with that new schedule. And we appreciate you all understanding. All, and I can't wait to see how this show grows over the, uh, after uh, the upcoming many, many episodes to come. Have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. And remember, a day in America is always better when we are with our friends and fellow citizens. 